Welcome back to Decouple. Today I'm joined by returning guest James Flier, an Australian engineer and project manager with experience in power and the oil and gas sectors as well as the solar industry. Um, James is the founder of Down Under Nuclear Energy and I had the great pleasure of uh, meeting James in person in Toronto as part of a globetrotting tour uh, he was on alongside um, the Shadow Minister of Energy and Climate Change in Australia, Ted O'Brien. Um, we'll maybe chat about that for a second. Um, but today we are going to be doing a little bit of a digest of a recent episode um, with Nate Hagens um, on the topic of peak oil and the end of growth. Um, James actually introduced me to Nate Hagens as a thinker quite a while ago, um, and I didn't end up following up on that for some time, but have been uh, quite um, enthralled um, and a bit shook by uh, some of the analysis coming from Nate. So I wanted to digest that with my good friend, James. Um, enough uh, of an introduction here. Uh, James, how are you keeping, my mate? Really well, really well, thanks, Chris. And uh, I would just say the pleasure was ours catching up with you in Toronto. It was a terrific afternoon and evening. So again, thank you for your time. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, and it seems like that tour was uh, part of a pretty serious um, interest, if anything, certainly amongst this opposition Liberal Party um, in nuclear energy in Australia. Just very briefly, um, how are the prospects looking? Well, there's a determination uh, to, to learn more, um, to fill in gaps um, in our collective knowledge, and to really see where the US and Canada, uh, what, what their plans for, for net zero by 2050 entail. Um, what the role of nuclear is, what the role of other technology is, you know, are we realistically going to get there? You know, what sort of carbon offsets and abatements are required? So, you know, we had, gosh, I think we had 20 meetings across seven locations in in maybe two and a half weeks. Really productive. And it was a great trip. I've been asking a few guests this recently, but what is your honest take on net zero in general and net zero, say, by 2050? Um, with all of the knowledge that you have as an energy analyst, um, it, it feels very pie in the sky to me. I'm I'm all for, I guess I shouldn't say I'm all for. I'm I'm compelled by aspirational goals and and politics, but at the same time, uh, feeling increasingly like you know we're essentially racing in a speeding car towards the brick wall of of our expectations and are likely to be very disappointed. But just on on basic physics and your understanding of energy, <laughs> sure, net zero. Yeah, I mean. Possible, not possible, timeline. It's certainly impossible. Um, whether or not it's impossible whilst we maintain our current levels of consumption, GDP, um, well-being, health, all of, the, all of the things that we actually take for granted is an entirely different matter. Uh, and you know, I, have, I have serious doubts that we can maintain, um, as Nate would say, an oil, a fossil fuel civilization, particularly an oil civilization, and the standard of living um, and the and, and our way of life, um, in a in a net zero world. Right. There was a. I have to look at the source material for this, but there was a claim made that um, global CO two levels dropped significantly, and that coincided with um, uh, some colder weather. Um, I'm not sure if it was the year without a summer in Europe. Um, but that that was precipitated by essentially the great die off in the Americas from imported diseases from that Colombian exchange of of um, North America, uh, sorry of European settlers coming to North America, spreading their disease, and essentially a population collapse of something like ninety five percent of the uh, indigenous population. Um, anyway, that, that was a kind of fascinating anecdote, but that that's potentially one one route to net zero, but one <laughs> that we'd really like to avoid. Um, with, with that in mind, let's move on to the, the topic at hand. Um, so certainly the, uh, the episode generated a little bit of controversy. Um, you know, this, this podcast, its title draws, uh, its inspiration to some degree from, um, the eco-modern manifesto, um, this idea that, that it is possible to decouple the gains that we've made as, as, uh, an advanced industrial civilization, um, drops in childhood, maternal mortality, Etc. From ecological impacts that have been associated with industrialization, um, you know, a lot of people talk about the ways in which um, traditional religious beliefs have been supplanted by you know new ideologies and philosophies. And you know, when you step back and look at eco modernism, there is a narrative there which is um, maybe a little pseudo religious. Um, certainly, it's quite optimistic. 
um, this idea that there are no limits, um, that you know, super abundance is possible, be, you know, with a combination of you know, human ingenuity, technology, potentially resource substitution. Um, and Nate Hagen's thesis really, really flies in the face of that. Maybe just for those who, um, you know, the episode was a, a, a few months ago, if, if you could kind of summarize, um, you know, your, your assessment of, uh, or your, your take on the, on the great simplification um, thesis. Well, this will be pretty quick because I'll say from the outset, I find very little to disagree with, um, with Nate's thesis. It's very well researched. It's developed over a couple of decades. Um, I've been listening to Nate and reading his material for, I guess it must be about five years now. The, the fundamental premise is we live our civilization, our way of life, the way we structure ourselves is based on hydrocarbons, in particular oil. I'm fortunate I can see the industry from the inside, and so I know this, its scale. I know how many different products that come uh, that are derivatives from oil, um, less from gas, but plenty from gas as well. Uh, and I also know that we live in a world with abundant, cheap, massive transportation. And, you know, maybe we can tease that out a little bit later, but I think that's going to be that we have a lot of, you know, we talk about, you talk about decouple and I, and I think it's a, I think it is a, an idea that must be pursued, you know, seriously, but I don't think that we can hope to decouple completely and maintain our current civilization. And, and I would say that some things are going to, some things are going to um, change. I think Nate's put his finger on it. Um, that's probably going to happen. I mean, Nate and I, probably one area of dispute we may have is the, is the timeline. Um, but that's, you know, that's really quibbling, to be honest. The fact is, we know how the vast majority of oil in the Earth's crust got there. Or we, have, we, have a fairly, we have a fairly good working hypothesis. There's no reason to think that it got there any other way. Um, and... We know it's finite. How finite? Hard to say. There's still a lot of oil left. Saudi Arabia, Russia, Venezuela, Iran, Iraq. Um, obviously, the problem for the West is many of those nations who hold the massive oil reserves that would underwrite our our collective advanced civilizations for, for several more decades easily uh, aren't, aren't very well disposed to us. Um, even Saudi Arabia, um, a long ally of the West, is is less well disposed to us than it once was. And so, you know, this may be visited, this simplification that Nate talks about may be visited upon us sooner than we anticipate for reasons that, you know, and, and it will happen before the end of oil. We will see it before the end of oil, I believe. So, I mean, Nate's, Nate's thesis is that as oil becomes less plentiful, so he's not talking about running out, he's saying less plentiful, less abundant and more expensive, that starts to create seismic movements in our financial system, um, you know, in our monetary system uh, that cascade through because of the monetary overlay and the amount of debt that we've racked up, which is a future ship claim on energy, as Nate points out. Um, that that really also completely have to has to change our sort of six continents supply chains. So. It, you know, you, you really need to spend months just thinking about the implications to to get your head around it. And, and I have. Nate has spent much longer than that. And, and I find very little to, to disagree with Nate's thesis. Right, right. I mean, we have had um, some oil shocks before. I mean, that wasn't related to the absolute supply of oil. This was, you know, political factors. You know, were events around those oil shocks some kind of foreshadowing of, of the implications of limits on particularly liquid hydrocarbons? Do we have any sense of what's coming, I guess, based upon on those experiences? I, I would say yes and no. And the, the yes part of it is, sure, we, we saw prices go up. We saw uh, many locations, uh, you know, I, I wasn't alive at the time, and I'm thinking about the 1970s here, um, but many places where you couldn't get oil derivative products, fuel, your car, at any price. It just wasn't available. Um, and that changed the way people, for a, for a period of time, changed the way they worked, changed the way they lived, changed the way they holidayed, 
Um, you know, and I'm, I don't have a, a deep history of, of the episode, but there, I think it's a pretty safe bet to say that there would have been some sort of top-down allocation of fuel at that, as, they, as they got through that crisis. The problem is, you know, you talk about substitutes. There's, there's very few substitutes uh, at scale. I would say no substitutes actually at scale for, for diesel engines, uh, for heavy fuel engines, for aviation turbines, you know, maybe at personal transportation vehicles, yeah, you can use petrol, gasoline, uh, electric vehicles. But for those, those transport applications that really provide that sort of um, essential layer, you know, that life support layer for transporting food and, and other goods around, we don't have a substitute for that. And so, yeah, we could probably roll back and, and read the history and understand what they did to cope with it, but that was short term. The other thing I'd point out is globalization really hadn't hit its straps by that point in time. Vehicles were simpler. Supply chains were much, much shorter. Uh, and so, you know, particularly in the United States, um, pro which probably felt it maybe a little bit more than Australia did, um, they weren't as reliant on imports at that point in time. And they, right. and they still felt it. I think, I think now it would be a totally different thing because we, we just don't know where all of our consumer goods and essential goods come from. It's very hard to work it out. We certainly had these, you know, little tastes of supply chain disruptions. I've noticed that mostly in uh, the medical area, but, um, you know, we had about a month, which coincided beautifully with our kind of viral uh, flu RSV season where, you know, there was no Tylenol or Advil uh, on the shelves for children in particular. Um, so our emergency departments were overrun by kids with just basic fevers that weren't being treated. Um, but there's, I think everyone, um, you know, probably more in, in relation to COVID, uh, but also, um, to some degree, the energy crisis we've seen, um, we've seen some nigglings of that, which, you know, are at least in my life feel pretty unprecedented. Um, I wanted to, you know, certainly we're going to follow up on, on globalization and its dependence on liquid hydrocarbons and, you know, globalization, uh, to as a casualty of that. Um, but so much of the energy debate, um, the clean tech um, uh, discussions, the energy transition discussions, uh, the journalism are are based upon you know this idea of you know testing this hypothesis of you know are there substitutes, and you know we'll frequently see breathless stories about pilot projects um, without a good sense of scalability. So I mean, you have um, at least in how you speak, like a fair amount of confidence in what you're saying about the inability to substitute at scale for X, Y, and Z, you know, diesel engines, uh, you know, jet fuel, et cetera. Um, I'm just curious about, you know, you're coming to that statement and that confidence based upon a life experience and engineering background working in, in these industries. Um, that, that's not coming to you from say modeling or like a different sort of epistemology or way of knowing. I'm just curious about that because um, it does seem hard for the lay public to grasp. Um, and in terms of communicating that confidence or, or showing the kind of evidence or the work behind that confidence, is that just kind of tacit knowledge um, from everything you've been exposed to from, you know, working on the nuts and bolts side of energy? I don't know if you know where you kind of get where I'm going with this question, but. It's a good question. And it's something that the, the engineering profession has has struggled with how to communicate how, how to communicate issues of scale um, and how to communicate you know issues of, of non compatibility non non substitutability um, how would, what's the best way to what's the best way to explain it I suppose it it's taken the industrial revolution, you know, well, the oil part of the industrial revolution, let's say, started in the in the second half of the of the nineteenth century. The technologies that we have evolved in that time are now one hundred and fifty, one hundred and sixty years um, worth of refinement, worth of improvement, worth of finding better ways to do things, how to get more energy. Uh, more useful work, rather, um, from from the same amount of energy, and that's a that's a difficult process. It it takes countless um, billions of investment 
It takes an extraordinary amount of time and industrial commitment. It takes years and years of prototyping, of, of, of making tiny, tiny little tweaks to things, whether it's materials, whether it's um, finding new ways to control engines, you know, whether it's emissions, whether it's, it doesn't really matter what it is. It's, it's also to do with the infrastructure that's been built up over that time to supply liquid fuel. I mean, we don't even think about it when we get in our car, really, do we? We know we're going to get, and there's, we're going to get to a fuel station. The fuel's going to be there. We're going to put it in our car, and the car's just going to go. And it's pretty cheap, all things considered. You know, it very, very rarely do we stop to pause and think, what are all the steps that had to happen in order for that to be so reliable and so dependable and so safe? That is non-replicable in any meaningful time frame. It is, it is 106, 150, 160 years of concerted, consistent, massive industrial effort. Um, and so, you know, does that mean in 150 years' time, 200 years' time, we haven't figured out something different um, that uses a different um mode of technology and different fuel source, you wouldn't rule it out, but you would rule it out in the short term. You would rule it out by 2050. I, I don't see any credible alternative. Um, I, truthfully, I don't see a credible alternative this century. You know, we have, we have ways of making substitutes for, for diesel. Um, you know, there are, there are definitely options to electrify or shift some types of propulsion to natural gas, for example, which is far more abundant. Um, these are, but these are all trade-offs. Let's be under no illusions. None of these, uh, none of these are silver bullets. None of these solve the underlying dependence we have on oil. And all it means is the cost of everything goes up. And you can't get away from that. And the, and the last, you know, the last 10 years, um, you know, have been easy street in terms of ultra low credit, in terms of, uh, I, I, I kind of make this quote all the time is from Adam, Adam Rosenzweig and uh, Lee Gehrings, their, their analysis, I think their quarterly review of, in 2021, um, and just referencing that every form of, you know, primary energy dropped from peak to trough by 90% between 2010 and 2020, whether that was oil, gas, uh, uranium, coal, um, things are shooting back up. Um, you know, Bill Gates uh, in his book about climate change talked about this idea of a green premium that, you know, substitution will take place. There's this this premium, this gap between, uh, say, a, a, an ice vehicle, an electric vehicle. It's closing. You know, we just have to it's a very kind of consumeristic approach to solving climate change of, well, you know, how do we have the innovation that can close that gap? And then, you know, just the consumer choice will be a green choice and, and the energy transition will just kind of happen by itself if we have sufficient innovation. There's, 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 two, there's two stories. There's two stories of innovation, right? Like there is, the, there is the story of innovation that I would call maybe the Henry Ford story, which is, you know, innovation, both technical and commercial, was uh, instrumental in replacing horses with um, cheap, fairly reliable um, automobiles. And, you know, that's an industrial and commercial um, private sector success story. So that's one type of innovation. But there is another type of innovation, and that is the innovation of need. That is the innovation of, of desperation. And, you know, and I would sort of, I would suggest that that thesis of, well, the last 10 years, we've never had it so good. If we couldn't do it in the last 10 years, we're not going to do it. I would say that's exactly the conditions that you're not going to try and shift the needle. You have no, there's, there's no real driver to, you know, if you look at the, you look at the massive um, advances and leaps forward that that you know German uh, chemical engineers and scientists, industrial scientists, made in the late nineteenth century, early twentieth century, um, particularly between the world wars. That was from a position of desperation. So, so innovation comes through multiple means. It doesn't just have to be, you know, you don't have to have um, everything cheap, everything abundant. You know, I would say that there's not many. You need stresses for change and innovation sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a great counterfactual there. Well, let's let's talk a little bit more about um the simplification, um, the great simplification as as Nate labels it. Um, 
How do you do you foresee this playing out? What what does it look like? You, you've mentioned uh, Nate mentions um, and stresses the um, sort of supremacy in the holy trinity of fossil fuels, which was my little term there of of the liquid hydrocarbons. You have liquid hydrocarbons, gas, and coal. Um, you know, gas and coal seem to be still quite abundant um, and more fungible, um, even by things like nuclear, um, as we've seen here in Ontario, where we swapped largely nuclear for coal. Um, making coal illegal in this province. But um, in terms of the kind of non-fungibility of those liquid hydrocarbons, how does it start to percolate across societies and, and what do they start to look like? Um, you mentioned the differences in the oil shock in the 70s and now um, is is largely due to the impacts might be uh, exacerbated by globalization and six continent supply chains. But walk us through sort of how you foresee that looking like or, or patterning our societies. One thing I don't have a read on and uh... – I, I think you and Nate had a terrific com- part of your conversation about this was was really good, was the manner in which we will get to what's beyond uh, what's beyond our current form of civilization. So, you know, Nate talks about, um, you know, humanity will go on, we will have energy, um, we'll have a civilization, it just won't be this civilization. So if we think about this civilization and what comes after, you, to, to, use, to use Nate's um, framing there, the manner that individual nations, communities even, um, or the entire globe gets from there to, to there, I, I don't have a good read on that. Um, but we can, we can talk about that. I, I would say oil, what is the application of oil that is very hard to replicate? And the big one, of course, is transportation. You know, the, the, the amount of miles that the average person average person in advanced uh, nations moves in a lot in their in their life you know there are a lot of four score or whatever it turns out to be is and i don't i don't know the figures on this but i'm going to go out and say several orders of magnitude more than what it would have been 150 years ago people just people just didn't travel long distances from their home uh they didn't they didn't have the means of doing so, and it was and it was prohibitively expensive, and that meant sort of trips were usually often one way. You know, my ancestors came out to Australia and never went back, mainly probably because they couldn't afford to. Uh, you know, and that that story sort of replayed you know millions of times over. So we look at transportation. We say, well, what does what does a civilization look like where transportation is less massive? Is, has to be more selective because it's more expensive. Now, whether or not it's more expensive because you're you're trying to use synthetic fuels or you're trying to use electric, um, you know, battery powered semi trailers or nuclear powered merchant marine, it doesn't really matter. All of those technologies are going to be more expensive than the hydrocarbon equivalent. And so we're going to be incentivized to transport less things, less goods, and less goods uh, and people um, around the world. And what that means is, instead of having one super global economy that allows um, a massive degree of specialization, we're going to likely see um, that specialization and that industrial complexity decline. I, I believe it will decline. So instead of having, I mean, if you drive, if you drive a vehicle of, of say the 1970s or early 1980s and you drive a vehicle today, they have very different cars, you know, they feel different. One is much more comfortable, it's quieter, safer. Um, you know, there's a lot more things to do in it, whether it's listening to the you know, you don't just listen to the wireless anymore, of course. You've got all the, the enormous uh, screens in them, heated seats, you name it. And so all that complexity in our products, some of, I think some of that will be rolled back. Probably not all of it, but some of it certainly will be rolled back. Because a little country like Australia, uh, it may be different from Canada. You're next to the US, and so you, you've got industrial synergies and supply chains there that will probably – shield you from some of this, but smaller nations that aren't attached to really, really large industrial hubs, Europe, Northern Asia, North America, um, 
will either be paying top dollar for imported cars from those countries, in which case you have to find something to send them back that they want um, because you can't just run trade deficits forever, uh, or, or they will manufacture cars locally that just are not as sophisticated, not as comfortable, um, but can be largely manufactured you know, with a, in, in a smaller economy. And so I think, I mean, I use the example of automobiles, but um, I think this plays out to a lot of things. It plays out to building products, you know, the furnishings in your home, anything that's anything that's heavy uh, and large to transport will be will be um, may may become prohibitively expensive to to import. And you know, I think that another extension from that is if if there is a risk that we will lose some complexity. Do we want to be purposeful and and do we want to be selective with with the complexity that we lose? That you know, I, I guess guess here I'm equating the loss of complexity to a partial loss of human knowledge. Um, and as an engineer, like you know, I have a real um, fear that we will lose a certain type of knowledge in the process. And that's like the subset of knowledge called know-how, how to do things in the real world. You know, that's, you know, all knowledge is precious and and and, and should be preserved to, to the maximum extent possible. But there's a difference between, you know, let's say some obscure, some 15th century French literature from a particular region, uh, extraordinary though it may be, from losing know-how, the ability to design and make and fix and and provide useful services that improves people's lives, reduce human suffering, reduce human misery. Um, and my fear is that we will we will we will start to lose know-how if we if we are not purposeful about preserving it. I want to I want to deep dive this uh, sort of deglobalization a little further. Um, Peter Zihan, um has has written extensively on this. He has a book out. Um, I think it's the the end is just the beginning. Um, you know, hypothesizing this process, and I mean, it's interesting because he says globalization is going to be coming to an end mostly because of changing geopolitics and the U.S. no longer playing the role of um, policeman of the seas and assuring you know the free free flow of goods. But you know, another limitation potentially, as we're discussing, is is you know limits on plentiful hydrocarbons. Um, and what he talks about is is that you know the globalization era has allowed countries with sort of one of the four ingredients to industrialize that never would have been able to before. So I think those ingredients are you know the the proper minerals, the proper energy, whether that's coal, gas, oil, um, you know, plentiful agriculture, um, and and people essentially. I might be getting one of those ingredients wrong. Um, you know, if you just have one of those ingredients now, so you have you know cheap cheap labor, um, you know that can become the basis for for globalization, for, sorry, for industrializing your society. Um, and so that that was interesting to me because he's really positing a number of countries will not will not be able to maintain um, themselves as as industrial societies. Um, you know, when I was reading his book, I was thinking it seemed a bit far fetched that the U.S. would completely back off. Um, you know, being that global policeman of the oceans and and providing that sort of stability of trade. But, um, you know, what you're describing in terms of liquid uh, limits on liquid hydrocarbons and making some hard choices about what we decide to ship. You know, earlier on, you were saying we ship a lot of bulk iron ore around the world. Maybe we should reserve that that shipping capacity for, you know, lighter to transport specialty items um, and and try and localize some of the the shipping of of these kind of heavy, difficult to to move goods. Um, how does how does that how does that jive for you? Yeah, I mean, I'm familiar with the work of of Peter Zion, and you know, I, I would be I would be way outside of my field of expertise to you know really um, dispute anything he says with with regards to geopolitics. I do find it hard to believe that the US will give up globalization. Because there has been there's been losers to globalization, no question. Um, the American working class being one of them, um, and that that's been re- and that's been repeated at uh, different scales with all sort of developed nations, really. But that you know 
just having access to more people, and, and it's not just more labor, but it's more knowledge, it's more expertise, it's more specialization, has given us better, cheaper products. And it's not just consumer products. It's not just consumer products. It's also essential things that we use for things that we use for healthcare. It could be, it could, I mean, a lot of antibiotics, for example, are manufactured in Southeast Asia and Southern Asia. Um, it's, you know, it, it may be, it may seem simple by the standards of, you know, manufacturing a COVID vaccine in, in record time, but actually pharmaceuticals is a sophisticated industry and the Indians are able to um, produce really cheap, really high quality um, basic pharmaceuticals, which by the way, all of us use, and we use a lot more of them than we use of, of COVID vaccines, right? And, you know, I, I just don't see that the Americans are going to not, um, are going to choose to to not continue to access those large skilled populations that can manufacture um, essential things like that. I talk about healthcare, but that that plays out that plays out um, you know, a thousand times over in different in industries and, and classes of products. But it becomes really difficult when things are too expensive to ship. So you know the end of and it won't be the end of globalization. Um, I, I have a suspicion that because of the declining demographics everywhere in the world, we will probably need the global labor force to be more coordinated, more um, seamlessly integrated than ever as the global labor force as a percentage of the total global population that requires support um, decreases. You know, there is there is good reasons why the global labor force has to be even, you know, more greasy and and more like a sort of well-oiled machine. Um, but we are not going to have the luxury of cheap, cheap transportation to to sustain that. So what we we will have to be very, very select. I believe in time, I hope I'm wrong, by the way, but I believe in time we'll need to be very selective about what we choose to transport and where we choose to maintain complexity and sophistication and retain human knowledge and expertise at sort of cutting edge levels and where we go, you know what, <laughs> maybe maybe some of these, I would say more consumer oriented goods, um, maybe that's not the best use of our time and expertise and, and know-how. It's, it's interesting uh, just as a psychological frame. I mean, the tone that we're taking and certainly the tone of, of Nate's work is is pretty pessimistic about the future. Um, it's certainly not cornucopian and a world of endless possibilities. Um, I don't like, I much prefer to be in a different psychological frame. And I think encountering Nate's work, um, it, it frankly wasn't pleasant. Um, but I'm, I'm compelled to go to unpleasant places, I guess there's some cognitive dissonance there. Um, and it's just interesting noting that and noting a sort of shift in, in the tone of, of, you know, this interview versus, you know, other ones. Um, Let's let's um, maybe reflect on that for a second, but I, I do want to shift to the role of nuclear um, and the possibilities of nuclear in terms of maintaining some degree of complexity. Nate talks a lot about sort of this one-time carbon pulse, um, which is really what underlies the last you know two hundred years of um, you know skyrocketing progress from the Wright brothers to landing on the moon to to everything that humanity has accomplished, advances in science, materials, technology, etc. And, you know, that pulse will at some point, you know, and again, the timing you said is, is a bit up in the air, um, will be felt and will result in, you know, one, one of the, 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 the phrases, um, I think it's Stephen Keen, an economist that he had on the podcast uh, that most struck me was um, that technology without energy is a sculpture. Um, and that as we progress over that carbon pulse, you know, this, this is the, the kind of basis of a lot of the simplification that we could see. Um, we've constantly been able to push the Petri dish uh, walls further away from an expanding population base because of innovation, but that innovation's always been underpinned by, you know, increasing supplies of energy. Um, is there a role for a kind of uranium pulse to lessen the, the drop off of, of the carbon pulse? Um, you know, that's been sort of my reaction to Nate's work and, and in terms of making sense of it and making sense of, you know, what I've been devoting my life to for the last few years as a nuclear advocate. Sure. I mean, if we look at what oil is really good at, uniquely good at its transportation. And we look at what nuclear energy is really good at, it is stationary 
applications. And so thinking through what does an economy, how does an economy transition from one where many, a lot of its primary energy consumption is um, around the transportation of goods and, and, and products, materials, to one where a lot of its energy consumption is used in a, in a relatively confined geographical area. Um, and in that sense, you know, yeah, I think uranium's got um, a really important role to play, really important role to play. Uh, I would also not discount the role of coal um, and gas uh, in the in the sort of short to medium term. In the long term, for obvious reasons, you know, to do with to do with carbon emissions, we we will have to stop using those fuels eventually. Um, but but I wouldn't discount them in the short term. Uh, the Germans and other Europeans did so at their peril. Um, and there is a role, uh, you know, I believe there's a role for solar and wind and more hydro. Uh, and you know deep, um, uh, you know deep heat reserves within the earth, um, the you know, geological geological heat applications. Um, but really, if you're talking about something that can scale, that's carbon free, that's reliable, and stationary applications, it's pretty hard to go past nuclear energy. So I, I think it'll have a um, a significant role to play in the in in whatever civil whenever our civilization starts to look a little bit more like when we, when we reduce the amount of energy we use for transportation out of necessity, not out of choice, we're never going to do it out of choice. I mean, we have to be clear about that. Um, to be able to get on a plane and come and see you uh, and, and, you know, stop at seven locations or whatever it was throughout the mainland US and then fly back is not something that anyone is going to give up readily. Um, and so, you know, price will price and availability of oil will dictate that, uh, and we'll be a more stationary. We may become a more stationary um, civilization. That's a really interesting framing. I hadn't thought about energy transition in those terms. I mean, we've been flirting and and you know, I guess going around the edges of it in terms of discussing these implications of uh, limits on liquid hydrocarbons on on transportation, but. Um, just that framing of of nuclear and I guess coal as well and and, and gas, although maybe a little more transportable to a, to a more stationary um, energy underpinning and therefore how that ripples through and patterns um, our economies and societies, um, I think is is pretty fascinating. What, one one thing that deeply concerns me around becoming a more stationary civilization is um, particularly global food networks. You know, because so much food. Um, is transported around the earth to people who who would perish without it. Now, I don't mean the Western Australian rock lobster that is that is caught where I live and is rushed down in chilled salt, filtered salt water um, to the local airport and then flown to Northern Asia for like really wealthy Northern Asian customers. Um, yeah, I think we can give that up, and 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 no one's going to be too worse off when that becomes prohibitively expensive. But like, I mean, the massive grain ships that leave the United States and Canada and Australia and, and you know, other, other locations, particularly South America, to go and feed the Middle East, to go and feed parts of Africa, to go and feed the subcontinent, Northern Asia. Um, you know, we, we, we really will need to find a way to ensure that we can maintain enough transportation for, for everyone to get more than enough to eat in the different parts of the world. Pivoting back to nuclear again, um, you were talking earlier about um, that interwar period in Germany where so much uh, innovation was unleashed uh, to solve a couple of crises that they faced. Um, and again, this book, The Alchemy of Air, is one that I just can't recommend enough, really describing that period. But, you know, essentially being cut off from uh, Peruvian guano, Chilean nitrates, needing to learn how to fix the air, fix nitrates from the air to, to make both explosives and fertilizers. Um, and later being cut off from liquid hydrocarbons, um, figuring out coal gasification. Um, totally fascinating period. Um, you know, when one looks at, at nuclear right now, um, there's not the drive uh, for that innovation. And not just technological innovation, but just, I think, regulatory innovation to unleash the full potential of, of nuclear. Um, I, I guess that's something, um, again, necessity being the driver of innovation. I'm probably butchering the, the, the phrase there. 
that's something that kind of lurks as a possibility because you know right now it does look like it's Im nuclear is impossibly slow even when done well the, the permitting etc um and i guess we have some historical precedents to look back on when there was that pragmatic drive to to nuclearize um you know france france did it quite quickly um to a lesser degree you know my province did it quite quickly um but do you do you foresee you know nuclear energy being unleashed or some people will say that you know with a lack of um of uh, specialization maybe nuclear is not possible in a in a world of a great simplification what, what are your thoughts well I'll, I'll, i guess the, dealing dealing with the second part of that question first is i think i mentioned earlier i believe we will have to be selective in the complexity and the know-how we decide to to roll over um i mean i'm not saying we're going to be losing all of our industrial know-how and all of our um, and not just industrial, but 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 medical and um, and, and scientific as well. Um, we will lose some of it. The, the global population, global available working population, capable of doing that sort of work, will shrink in time anyway. Um, and of course, with the reduction of supply chains that can leverage incredible specialization to make sophisticated products, um, you know, our products will become simpler, as I mentioned. So that doesn't mean we can't choose to retain complexity in the areas that are strategically important. And I would say air, energy is one of them. And I would say nuclear energy is one of them. The, you know, frankly, what, what other options do we have? Really, I mean, if we're, if we're really serious about reducing carbon emissions um, this century, I won't say by mid-century, I, I you know, think that's, um, uh, frankly, I think it's a little bit silly to keep, keep talking about that uh, so optimistically, but certainly by the end of the century, then uh, I, I don't see that we can choose to not carry our nuclear expertise into the future and expand it and grow it. But, but actually innovation is not, not our immediate challenge in, in the nuclear industry. And, you know, you mentioned before, it's hard to get a nuclear plant built in, in North America, the same is true for Europe. Um, impossible to build them in my country but that's not just nuclear plants that's transmission lines that's new port facilities um, i mean any major project that you can think about really it's just about it's just about impossible to permit these days so we have a real challenge and i think this seems to be a uniquely western thing the, the japanese and the koreans and the chinese don't seem to don't seem to have this problem. It's not just we can't build nuclear plants. We don't want to build nuclear plants. We can't build very much of scale in the way of infrastructure, um, and we, we, and that's by choice. We don't want to, and I, I don't know why we don't want to, but I think it's because there's large, really large portions of the population who don't think we need to. Um, do we need another port? Do we need another transmission line? Do we need another tunnel under um, under under Sydney? I don't know. A lot of people don't seem to think so. Um, but we will as we transition from a highly mobile civilization to one that's a little less mobile. We will need that infrastructure. And uh, I think crisis will precipitate a change of heart. I hope it will. You know, in terms of the difficulty in getting things built, um, and I was referencing that 2010 to 2020 period, um, partially in, in regards to innovation, but also just, you know, cheap commodities prices, um, something that's going to delay, you know, rapid deployments of, of things like transmission, generation, et cetera, is just that the prices are going up. Um, you know, we've seen that with offshore wind, for instance, with Siemens Gamisa announcing, you know, uh, cost increases of 40%. Uh, interestingly, the, the revised numbers on new scale also are an increase by 40%. Um, you know, that that's going to have implications. Um you know, wind and solar was deployed quite quickly in that decade period, um, partially because of cheap commodities. If we're facing constraints now, um, that infers that we need to make choices about what to, you know, where to maintain that complexity, as you've said. Who decides that? Um, I know, you know, in terms of our politics, you're coming more from the center right. I'm coming more, well, frankly, my <laughs> early days right from the kind of extreme radical left. Um, but this infers that some degree of planning is going to come into play. Um, 
is your vision of that 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 would be mostly market based? Um, you know, what do you what do you think is uh, how our politics are going to change? Or, or in terms of, you know, it sounds like you're wanting to um, say that hey, maintaining pharmaceutical complexity is is a value that we that I have that's important to me. Um, is that going to conflict with you know what the markets say? I mean, already we see. We don't develop a lot of new antibiotics, despite them being very, very important medications, because you only need those for a week or two and you're better. We want lifestyle drugs. Like that's what the market prioritizes. So if we're coming into a world of, of constrained resources and, and, and uh, simplicity, what, what do you think is the optimal kind of politics to navigate that? <laughs> Big question. There. Big question. <laughs> Just, <Yeah. whew. laughs> well, you know, the market is an extraordinary mechanism for coordinating information, resources, effort, basically, um, you know, to, to satiate uh, demand for something. But I don't, I don't think it's a flawless coordination mechanism for, um, for all industries and for all human needs and wants. And I'm talking in the economic space. I'm not talking, you know, um, beyond our material needs. I'm talking just within the work realm of material needs. We see this in the power system. You know, in Australia, we have a, a power system that is as close to free market as we could as we could get. Um, very similar to the system in Texas and, and similar to the one in UK. Um, and it just hasn't been very successful. We don't get timely, well targeted investment to replace the capital stock of assets that are that are um, retiring, getting to the end of their life. Um, and we have a situation where the assets that we need to remain in the system don't make sense for their owners to keep them in the system. And so we have this, you know, where tactical decisions at the business level are going in the opposite, uh, opposite direction to decisions we need to make at a strategic level about how to maintain a power system that, that functions and is reliable and is affordable. And I think you can probably expand this to other other sectors, but but you want to be really careful. I mean, would you ever let politicians in charge of the growing and distribution of food? I mean, like I think that's a that's a sure surefire way to kill a lot of people really quickly. Um, so I don't know what the balance is. I suspect energy energy will be is already more strategic. It'll become more strategic. It'll need to be more coordinated. There'll be a role for the, uh, probably a role for a, a large, strong government to have an overarching framework of how energy is developed um, and and how we replace our legacy systems. But there's there'll be a role for the private sector. They provide the technology. They're the ones who are going to operate the assets. Um, you know, I don't know where that mix is. Um, Liquid fuels has always been, well, in the West anyway, has always been the, or for a very long time, has been the province of private capital because, frankly, the best geologists and petrophysicists in the world work for um, Western um, vertically integrated sort of super major oil and gas companies, whether it's sort of European or North American. Um, so they know where the gas is. They know where the oil is. Could, could you replicate that? Um, if you nationalise them, I don't think so. I, I, I find I find it unlikely. So if you really want to run down existing assets, maybe you could nationalise them. But if you want to go and find more um, oil and gas um, to, to, to to tie you through a difficult period that you come out the other side of, yeah, I think you need to let the private sector do what it does. So it, it's not a there is no answer that you can apply to all industries and all sectors. It's it's very much a what's the what's the expression I've heard lately. Um, you know, it's the best athlete approach. You choose the best athlete for a particular job. Sometimes it's government, sometimes it's private. Most of the time, it's probably going to be a bit of both. Right, right. No, I mean, there's there's that quote, um, hard times make hard men, hard men make soft times, soft times make soft men. And I think it's easy to guess sort of where we are in the cycle there, um, emerging into, well, I'll answer that question. <laughs> I think emerging into a new series of, of hard times, which require, as you're saying, um, you know, more strategic thinking um, and a more sober analysis of what's working, what's not, and some form of intervention. And I guess, you know, it's, it remains to be seen who will be making that intervention. 
certainly I think um, there's going to be a maturity that will come to policymakers where we can no longer have, you know, ministers of uh, the ecologic transition. We will have ministers of energy again and that they will have some, if not technical uh, background, serious advisors um, because it's too important of a, a portfolio to fumble. Um, and I, I, are you seeing hints of that starting to happen or starting to play out? Or do you think that's still to come? Undoubtedly. Undoubtedly. I mean, you can, I mean, I'm obviously most familiar with the Australian context, but you can go and read an energy policy from 2001. And it was kind of like an energy, and I have, I've actually, actually had, a, had calls to look at it today. It was like, we have to have an energy policy. We can't not have one. Um, but in reality, we're not really doing anything. And maybe a bit of market reform. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll give renewables a bit of a try. Um, you know, maybe we'll incentivize some crazy kind of gas to liquids technology and a million dollars for a study to export hydrogen. This is back in 2001. Um, but it was it was not a policy that they were going to fight over in an election. And, you know, energy just wasn't an election issue. Um, it hasn't been for the Western world, I think, for, for, for many decades. It is now. It absolutely is now. Um, and so the, the amount of thinking uh, and the amount of debate that goes on internally, the amount of outreach to, to industry to sort of try and fill in gaps in, in the knowledge of the, for various different parts is, has shifted gears over the last five or six years. You know, just from conversations I've had, but also from what I've seen in the media and, and what I've been told by other people. So, yep, um, history's, um, history's catching up. Um, you know, energy is important again. Well, James, I've got to uh, actually jump on a, a call with some local media. Um, and it is around um, a new energy policy in Ontario. Um, it's our pathways to decarbonization. There you go. They are getting serious people to help them with energy. Well, here's the thing. Um, you know, what's what's being potentially forecasted or modeled um, is a dramatic increase in nuclear energy, adding another 18 gigawatts. Um, we currently have about 13 or 14 installed. Um, you know, an absolutely massive uh, project of building um, with one historic precedent, and that is our, our historic can-do build-up. We've done some nice graphing that, that shows that if we were capable of doing what we did in the 70s and 80s, we could potentially meet that goal. But in terms of the seriousness of the document, they also say we should uh, have about 16 gigawatts of hydrogen in the mix um, without much of an explanation as to how we synthesize and make that where that power comes from. So I've been, I've, I've been looking at that document and just shaking my head as as an example of some profoundly unserious thinking and, uh, you know, a document that if, if, you know, energy planning was happening in the seventies, they, they wouldn't be making sort of pie in the sky. You know, we're going to base our plans on, um, you know, an energy carrier as an energy molecule and, and not, not sort of thinking that stuff through. But I think, you know, the, the desperation of, of dealing with climate change can lead to some pretty fantastical thinking. And, you know, I opened the, the interview with that question about, you know, what do you think the possibilities are of net zero time frame, et cetera? Um, I mean, you have a lot more expertise in terms of analysis and en engineering um, background, but, um, you know, my, my sort of uh, gestalt sense is, is that, you know, looking at, you know, fossil fuels as the, the pillars of modern civilization, you've, you've kind of beat around the bush a little bit that it could happen, but it won't look anything, uh, like what we have around us now, I think it's it's pretty dystopian, and we're we're really dealing with these these two challenges where you know solutions to climate change um, involve uh, massive costs um, in terms of constraining fossil fuels. That we are wedded to fossil fuels um, for our current civilization, and you know simplification may not mean um, you know decrease in emissions even, but maybe that's uh, fodder for for another conversation. We, we, we have a fossil fuel way of life. Um, at some point, we will still have a way of life. It'll still, probably still be really good. Um, it just won't be a fossil fuel way of life. It'll be different. I think it'll be more stationary, amongst other things. <laughs> okay, let's leave it there, my friend. It's very late in Australia. Thank you for uh, making the time. And uh, we will chat again soon and hopefully meet again in person soon. My pleasure, Chris. Good to talk to you. Thanks so much for having me on.